Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you so much for being here for our third Casework Navigator training. And we have heard a lot of questions about navigating agency relationships in our kickoff event a few weeks ago, and then our appropriations for caseworkers event last week. So I am so excited to dive deeper into this topic uh, in today's session. So if you are a veteran caseworker, you know that your agency relationships are absolutely some of the most valuable tools in your toolbox. And new caseworkers, if there is one thing that I can hope that you keep in mind and take away from today, it's that those relationships take time and effort to build and maintain, but they are crucial to being effective for your work on behalf of your constituents. Um, but this all happens in a larger context. It's been a rough few years for agencies and caseworkers have really seen uh, from the front lines how that impacts constituents and the constituents that you both serve. Um, staffing levels across many agencies are in tough shape. Agencies are also still paying down technical debt to modernize their constituent facing systems in different ways. And those modernization processes can create some friction. On top of those structural factors, agencies have been through the same rough few years that y'all have. Uh, if your caseloads go up, the same thing happens to your liaison's counterparts, uh, your liaison counterparts caseloads. Um, now the relationship between Congress and agencies is naturally uh, and rightly a bit adversarial. That's what oversight is. But starting off on the right foot can still uh, create and maintain the pro professional relationships can really pay off enormously uh, for your advocacy. So today that's what we're diving into. We are diving into a deep dive on what it's like to work on the agency side, uh, communicating with Congress, um, what caseworkers may not understand about the role of agency liaisons, and some tips on how to build those professional working relationships. And I am Absolutely thrilled to welcome our speaker today, Nina Olson, who is the executive director for, of the Center for Taxpayer Rights. Um, if you've been a caseworker for a few years, you are probably familiar with Nina's role, uh, Nina's previous role. From March of 2001 to July of 2019, Nina served as the National Taxpayer Advocate of the United States. Uh, and TAS is an independent organization within the Internal Revenue Service dedicated to assisting taxpayers to resolve their problems with the IRS and making administrative and legislative recommendations to mitigate those problems systemically. Nina is no stranger to Congress. She has submitted 39 annual reports to Congress and testified before congressional committees over 60 times. Uh, and before serving as the National Taxpayer Advocate, Nina founded and directed the Community Tax Law Project, the very first independent low-income taxpayer clinic in the US. Um, and she also maintained private legal practice representing taxpayers in disputes with the IRS. Her list of awards and recognitions is too long to get into here, um, but let me just uh, uh, pop this one out that in 2016, she was recognized by tax analysts as one of the 10 top 10 outstanding women in tax internationally. So we are truly speaking to an international expert and we're so delighted to have us uh, have her with us. Nina, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This is just um, a real honor to be here. And it's a really important topic that I care deeply about. So thank you for letting me be here. Absolutely. We are delighted to, to have your expertise. Um, so let me just uh, maybe start us off with a little bit of context here. So especially for our new caseworkers and caseworkers in new offices on the call. So you were the founding taxpayer advocate. Um, can you share a little bit about TAS's structure and the vision behind it? And just a little question. I'm not the first taxpayer advocate. Oh, okay. One before me, and that person, Val Ovison, um, who came from Utah, uh, and a CPA did all, I keep saying he did all the heavy lifting in the year and a half that he was there in that he hired all the people and everything like that. And so I got to come in in 2001 and have the fun of deciding how we were going to use these people. And so I didn't have to do all that heavy lifting. Um, you know, the, the taxpayer advocate service really is a creature of Congress, which sometimes that makes us a little different from maybe some of the other agencies that you're dealing with that that it was it's a part of the it was established in the internal revenue code it is a statutory position and a statutory office there's actually a law that describes what we're supposed to do and it's very specific. Um, I won't go into all the details, but it was created by Congress to help taxpayers solve their problems with the IRS and identify administrative and legislative recommendations to mitigate those problems. So we're not just limited to saying, here's how the agency needs to be fixed, but also here's maybe how you can change the law to prevent some of the problems that are coming up. And Congress was also very specific about how we would be organized. Uh, and all of this came from some of the predecessor 
entities that were created over the years and and taxpayers and Congress's dissatisfaction without how with with how they were operating. Um, so there's a national taxpayer advocate. And by law, that national taxpayer advocate reports directly to the commissioner, but is appointed by the secretary of the treasury. So the commissioner who serves for five years and can be under any party um, cannot fire the national taxpayer advocate. It's only the secretary that can ask the national, well, the president could, but the, the secretary of the treasury could ask the national taxpayer advocate to set down. And um, you serve without a term. And therefore, that's how I served for 18 years under commissioners and secretaries nominated by both parties um, and many different presidents. Um, anyway, there's the national taxpayer advocate, and then there are local offices. And Congress has required by law that at least there is at least one local office in each state. And I think that's incredibly important for constituent service. And I had tried during my years to make that really reiterate that to my own employees. Not only is this a statutory requirement, but it makes sense for our job that as the IRS and many federal agencies get larger and larger and also to save resources, they centralize their functions. They have big you know, service centers in certain locations where work is being done. But, um, you know, you're losing a local presence. And so the Taxpayer Advocate Service, by design, has about 78 local taxpayer advocates around the country. So definitely one in each state, and in some states more than one, because they're, they have a larger population. And because I'm a resident of the District of Columbia, the District of Columbia has a local taxpayer advocate. And Puerto Rico has a local taxpayer advocate. And our Hawaiian taxpayer advocate is also responsible for some of the other um, the other uh, uh, territories like Guam and the Mariana Islands and things like that. And the idea is that these local offices know their constituency. They know the taxpayers in their community, both individual and and business, and they have relationships with the congressional offices in that community. Um, just to finish up this kind of overview, the, um, the job of the taxpayer advocate, the case advocates in those local offices, is to take cases where taxpayers are experiencing significant hardship and work them. And that can be um, significant hardship is defined in the law and the regulations as taxpayer is experiencing significant hardship as a result of something the IRS is doing, not doing, which has been an issue the last few years with the backlog, you know, because of the pandemic, et cetera, not doing or about to do that could create either economic harm to the taxpayer or could mean that the ta there's a systemic problem underlying it, mainly the taxpayer tried to solve the problem through normal channels and just hasn't been able to get an answer. And those cases come into task and you are assigned one case advocate, whereas with the IRS, you may be dealing with multiple people and everybody that you call, the next time you call, you get a different person. When you come into the taxpayer advocate service, you get one person assigned to your case, and that person has a toll-free number that you can call to get directly to them, and if you don't get them, you get their personal email, I mean voicemail, um, and, and then that employee works the case, that case advocate works the case, and works with the IRS on the, you know, the other side to advocate for the right result per the, you know, the taxpayer and the case advocate, what they agree is the right result. And also are able to elevate it up if the IRS disagrees with that to try to get final action. And the years that I was there, we had over 4 million taxpayer cases, which formed a real database of what was going on and, you know, what was going wrong in the IRS. And from that came the other part of our job, which was to make systemic recommendations. So again, those administrative and legislative recommendations to mitigate those problems. And that goes to also another form of our relationship with Congress through my annual reports to Congress. You know, that's where I made the administrative and legislative recommendations that we made public, as opposed to all the work we did inside the building. Um, 
And, you know, members of Congress welcomed those recommendations because it really came from what we were seeing, what we were hearing in our casework and the other forms in which we gathered information about how taxpayers, what, how taxpayers were experiencing the tax law. That's amazing. And let me just flag for caseworkers on this call. If you have not taken a look through those annual reports, they are fascinating reading. Uh, and I'd really, really recommend uh, taking a look for the kind of the context um, in which you're, you're getting constituent inquiries. Um, and maybe that brings us to um, just thinking, like you said, so the, the case advocates that are actually in all those local offices and who are working most directly with their congressional, congressional staff, congressional caseworkers, um, their role is also a little bit like a congressional caseworker in that they're working with the public and then they're also working with the agency, with the IRS staff. Um, what went into training those, those caseworkers? Well, you know, our caseworkers came from all parts of the IRS, and we also hired them from outside the IRS so that if we could get, you know, people who had been return preparers or people who had accounting degrees or things like that. Um, and my goal had been to really have a mix of employees so that sometimes you'd get them from the people who work the phones. Sometimes you'd get them from the people who were auditors or collection employees. But they all were self-selected. You know, they wanted to, after a career on, you know, that side of the IRS, they wanted to actually have some control over the cases that they had and really do some advocacy work. And um, we trained them on everything, you know, and we never, you know, we first had a generalist training. So if you came from the call site, then we had to get you up to speed on audit and collection issues. Uh, the other thing was that you really wanted a diverse office so that there were rep people with different backgrounds in that office so that they could share their knowledge and work in a collegial environment. Um But, you know, we always, we had an annual training symposium every year, sometimes you know, it was in person more recently, um, virtually, but that it, we, I really tried to design it like a college curriculum where you had mandatory courses, then you had electives and things like that so that you could both build your career, but you were also getting the technical training. And I also have to say, I mean, I did technical training as well. They needed to know what I expected of them. Um, and, and, you know, share my perspective, having represented taxpayers for, quite a while in my life, before, you know, across the table from the IRS, being outside the IRS. Um, you know, that was a requirement for the job that in order to be the national taxpayer advocate, by law, you had to have represented individual taxpayers before the IRS. And I think that experience was very valued. Um, sometimes people in the agency, if they've never been outside the agency, and sat opposite the agency when you're trying to get something done, they really have no, they just don't have any idea about the experience of taxpayers. And that was a, that's a hard lift for our employees, particularly if they've come from an area where they're used to making a decision and having it happen, instead of having to convince the IRS employee that this is the right way to do things. And I think that's where there's also the parallel with caseworkers. You know, you know that there needs to be a result or some kind of solution, but you don't have anybody on the other side who's who's seeing your way or even responding and or explaining why these things are happening. And my own employees would feel that frustration. They couldn't get any action on it. One of the benefits is that Congress had given um, the local taxpayer, well, the national taxpayer advocate, and I delegated it down to the local taxpayer advocates, the ability to order the IRS to do something. And if we ordered the IRS to do something and they refused, it would go up the management chain very quickly to land on my desk. And then I was send, I was issuing that order over to the head of office. Um, and that got a lot of attention and uh often resolved the issue. And then where it didn't resolve the issue, we were required by law to report that to Congress, those instances where the IRS commissioner refused to follow the recommendation, the order of the national taxpayer advocate. And again, that led to, you know, systemic changes. It might have generated some letters from members of Congress, um, might have generated some legislative change. Uh, certainly would have generated some questions and hearings to the commissioner. You know, why are you doing this? Um, so there were lots of ways to get change and highlight 
what was happening with taxpayers. That's amazing. And two things I just want to pull out of that. I mean, first, obviously, you're you're speaking from your, your perspective with the Taxpayer Advocate Service and with the IRS, but you know, we've had kind of a few similar conversations with liaisons, just, hey, what do you wish caseworkers knew? What would be helpful for caseworkers to know? I mean, some of them have pulled out that exact same dynamic that for a lot of the agents liaisons, they're kind of also in that weird limbo where they have to have an adversary relationship of their own within the agency that they're representing. So it's worth just pulling that out. Um, but also the fact that taxpayer advocate service caseworkers chose to be there. I love that, that they wanted to be there on behalf of of the public and working with the public. I think sometimes, certainly in congressional office hierarchy, the further you get away from dealing with individual consist constituents, the more exciting and it's supposed to be. But I love the fact that your folks chose to be there and chose to, to work with the public. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, I can just say if you don't like human beings, you should not be a caseworker in nope. the taxpayer <laughs> advocate service. Just, I mean, that's not oh, a Congress this against you. It's yeah. just know yourself. And okay. if you're not curious about human beings and sort of have a fondness for what human beings do, even if it seems really strange, it's just, you should look for another job. And, <laughs> Absolutely. and often I had to say that to people, like, it really sounds like you're, let's find you someplace else where you'll be happy because you're feeling stressed and this is not fun for you, you know? That's so fair. And we know we've had some conversations with caseworkers in the same way that you have to kind of find the joy and find the curiosity, even yeah. when it gets tough. Um, but speaking of the moments where it gets tough. So the single biggest question that we got from caseworkers in preparation for this event was you're working with an agent's liaison and they go dark on you just for whatever reason, you're not getting the response that you need for your constituents. So from your perspective, from, from Tess, I wonder if we can kind of unpack what might be going on there. What just behind the scenes, What's yeah. happening when a liaison contact comes well, it is They may not know what to do next. You know, they've done what is they've normally been able to do to get an issue resolved. And the agency itself has gone dark on them and they don't know what to do next. And often what we found is that our people would just sit there then and just kind of shut down instead of elevating. And so a lot of our training with our local taxpayer advocates was to say, elevated up the, you know, we don't have a big management chain. Now, some of the agencies, you know, they're like 20 levels between the front line and up there, but in ours, there were really only three. And in some instances, only two, you know, between me and the frontline worker. And, and that was by design. Um, and so there, you know, elevate it up to your next level quickly. And then it's my job to make sure that the people that are closer to me are telling me what's going on and establishing that culture. Um, and I, so I think, so some of the prompt could be, you know, would it help if I elevated it? You know, that you're not maybe even putting it on the burden of that liaison. You don't want to throw that liaison under the bus, but you could offer, you know, would you like my boss to weigh in or elevate something. The other thing that that we did was we required all communication between the local office and the congressional office to be from the local taxpayer advocate. So although there was a case advocate working the case directly with the taxpayer, if we got a communication from the local constituent you know, worker, it was the local taxpayer advocate that was responding and communicating. And if we were sending them stuff like a letter that was giving them an update or something, it had to be an actual letter. It couldn't be like a fax cover sheet that just had some notes scribbled on it. And it had to come from the local taxpayer advocate. And that's in our guidelines. And the idea was that that would force, you know, awareness and, and, you know, a uh, touching base uh, and communication between the office and build trust. Um, I'd also say, you know, that in our cases, regardless of whether it's congressional or not, you know, there were guidelines and deadlines for, you know, you have to, when's your next follow-up date with, on this case, you know, that you have to do some action on this case and when's your next contact with the case. And that's put in the case history. And the managers are supposed to look at that to make sure 
that you're keeping the case moving along, even if it's going to take a while. But even with all that, people would just get either overloaded or they just didn't know what the next step was. And sometimes that's where maybe just encouraging or saying, you know, could we bring in some other resources? You know, is, is there a technical issue? Would, would you, do you need my help in getting this before someone else or something like that? Um, could suggest, you know, without trying to put blame on that particular individual that you're going to have to work with. And the final thing I just say is that everybody knew my email address, you know, and so I had members of Congress or their staff, you know, emailing me and saying, we're not getting a response. And that was fine. I, I wanted to know that. And then I normally I wouldn't be the one going out because that always feels like a sledgehammer, you know, if they get an email from me. But you know, I would ask, you know, one of the attorney advisors on my staff or um, the District of Columbia local taxpayer advocate, that office was kind of designed to work my cases as well, you know, as the cases for Washington, D.C. And I would ask that local taxpayer advocate, their peer, essentially, to go out and talk and say, you know, we've gotten a call about this. What's going on with the case? And that person was a former, you know, was an attorney and um, had had worked my cases and so kind of knew what resources you could pull to the case if someone was really stuck. And we tried to treat those as learning experiences so that the, the local taxpayer advocate or the case advocate would know what to do the next time. Um, sometimes that wasn't always taken that way, but that's how it was intended. So I don't think you need to, you know, there's a way of maybe just reaching out even to the national office, which, you know, there are phone numbers listed. Um, it's 202-622-6100 is the office of the taxpayer advocate in Washington, D.C., and you can get a staff person and they can take a message and that will get down to the right person to look at, um, you know, and nudge what's going on with that case. That's amazing. I can only imagine how fascinating the cases that came to your desk were. They were interesting. <laughs> That's Some always, that's always just fun This way. week have resulted in a Supreme Court decision that was pro-taxpayer. So what can I say? That's wonderful. Uh, but you brought up two things that I do want to dig in on. First of all, it's just your framing of asking about escalation. I think it's so easy. I am certainly guilty of this uh, when I was a caseworker. It's so easy to think I'm coming in as Congress, I carry the big stick, and to have that request about escalation come off as threatening. So, hey, if I don't hear back from you, I'm going to call your boss. If I, we don't hear back from you, my boss is going to call your boss. And like it, it sounds aggressive, but I really love how you phrased it as, can I actually be helpful to you by pushing this up if you don't have what you need? So I just wanted to make sure we'd emphasize how useful that, that approach can be. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, so much of the time they're thinking, what more can I do about this? I've gone over, you know, now I will also say another thing you can ask is you can say, if they're, if the agency isn't paying attention to, is it about time to get a taxpayer assistance order? Now, again, this is specific to TAS and I'll come back to why I think there need to be more offices like TAS throughout the government. Um, but, you know, we have that ability to issue an order and the order is a formal way to ele elevate the issue and have it be documented, like forcing people to respond to you. When you issue that order, we're ordering that you respond to us within a certain amount of days, rather than saying, pretty please respond to us, which we always tried first. But then if they ignored us, it was, you know, ordering, you know, ordering the IRS and you will give us a response within this amount of time. And if you don't, it will go up the chain. And, and sometimes for us, just threatening to issue a taxpayer assistance order got the employee to respond because it means their man the issue order is going to be issued to their manager and the employee didn't want their manager to know what they were doing so suddenly you know we get the response that we needed other times we had to issue it and it just went up the chain which was fine because we were getting attention to it within really specific time frames so sometimes just saying you know, at least with the taxpayer advocate service, you know, maybe now's the time it's been a while, you know, maybe now's the time to issue a taxpayer assistance order on this case. What do you think? I, I will say that our employees 
you know, were a little scared of issuing taxpayer assistance orders. It was a battle I fought every day of my life to say this is a tool Congress gave us, use it. Um, and I've, I've, I've told this story before, but I was teach, doing a session with, you know, like all of my leadership and all of my senior analysts. And there must have been like 250 people in the room. And we were talking about taxpayer assistance orders. And I was ranting on about how they needed to use it. And, and somebody, you know, stood up and said, well, you know, I have relationships with the other function, you know, I'm trying to work with them and we have these relationships. And if I issue the order, it will really damage our relationships. And I just thought for a minute and said, then said to them, it's probably one of the best lines I've ever said in my entire life. I just said, you know, if, if a tax taxpayer assistance order destroys your relationship, you don't have a relationship, you have unrequited love. And the room just sort of, they just sort of looked at one another. And I thought it's an order, you know, it's your job. And if doing your job means your relationship with the function is destroyed, then you really don't have a relationship. It's one way and you might as well just start operating that way. So that changed a little bit, but he had to keep saying that to them. Definitely, that's so important. And that is such a good point about the just the depth of those relationships. Um, Nina, you gave us the number for the taxpayer advocate office in DC, and sounds like we have someone in the Q&A who, who would like that, that again, if you could just give us that number one more time. Uh, well, the, the main office is 202-622-6100. And I see a couple questions in the chat that are good. You know, who would be the best person in an urgent matter? I would go directly to your local taxpayer advocate. And then we have a question, you know, just, just go to them. Um, and I'll come back to what we expected the local taxpayer advocates to do. And then when you have a liaison who doesn't reply to your inquiries, you know, I, I think that's where you go to as high in the organization as you can. And if you've got other caseworkers who are experiencing that, then maybe you can get you can just arrange a call that says, this is just not working. We're not getting the response that we need. And maybe, you know, and really going to, if there is a communication function or a legislative affairs function in the agency, I would be going there and just getting that word out so that they can then take that to the appropriate head of office and get that taken care of. Because leg affairs should care deeply about that. And often the actual liaisons aren't necessarily in ledge affairs. They might be in another function kind of. Yeah, absolutely. And y'all great questions. We will have, we are very happy to take your questions. I have some more, but we want to prioritize yours. So please, 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 if you have questions, go ahead and throw those in the Q&A and we'll do our best to, to get to everybody. And maybe I should talk about just how, you know, what we expect of our local taxpayer advocates. Yeah, and this is wonderful. all in our, in our guidance to employees in the internal revenue manual. And I say our, I'm no longer with TAS, but you know, it's a habit. It's hard. Um, that, that you're, um, the, the, the issue there is that we, because we're local, we were we assigned not only zip codes based on congressional districts to the local offices. So if cases came in from the geographic, these geographic areas, they would be assigned to those offices as the first priority to work, unless they got you know, so overwhelmed that we had to ship them out. But our preference was always to keep that local contact and that local flavor of the casework in the offices. At the same time, we assigned congressional offices and senatorial offices to the different offices in the state. Now, if there was one you know, office in the state, then all of the congressional offices and the senators were handled by that office and had the relationship with that local taxpayer advocate. We required our local taxpayer advocate to reach out and have at least one meeting with local staff a year of every single congressional office. And then, um, and then often we encourage them to have it more than once, like if there was some big event that was happening or some change. And they were supposed to work very closely with the IRS personnel to arrange 
meetings, you know, congressional meetings to do briefings and things like that. But we also wanted that individual meeting. So you could talk with us about what you're seeing in the IRS and we could work on that. And they could share what we're seeing in the cases. In our best offices, and I think this is a best practice, our local taxpayer advocates who are really experienced when a new caseworker would come in, they would go and meet with that caseworker and talk about what you needed to do. The, the question about what do you do when you have a really urgent case? And they, you know, the, the local taxpayer advocate would say, and if you have a really urgent case, I want you to send it to me. Here's my email, here's my phone number, et cetera. And that that kind of interaction was incredibly important, um, but they would work through, you know, how you handle the cases. If you want to know about the taxpayer case, you know, here's the letter that you have to sign and send over to us, because otherwise under our confidentiality law, we cannot share specific taxpayer information, but you can get the taxpayer's permission and we'll be able to do that. And just walking through those procedures so there's no confusion. Um, and that kind of tending to relationships was done by the best offices and the most mature offices. I don't know whether it's being done now with, you know, people being out of office and COVID, but it's still at least one visit a year personally. And then the other thing that would happen is that once a year, the local taxpayer advocates would go up to Congress in Washington, DC. And, um, we would, we would, um, meet with the members of Congress and talk about what legislative recommendations we had identified in the annual report and what the 10 most serious problems that taxpayers are experiencing were discussed in the annual report. And from those conversations, we'd be able to gather what, who, what offices were interested in what issues, who wanted to maybe sponsor legislation who wanted more information, and that allowed me to follow up with them directly and work on issues. That's amazing. And can we just dive in on how unique that is among agencies? Part of what I want caseworkers to come away with from this call is this is this is best practices. This is what a congressional liaison service should look like. This is responsive. This is, like you said, the, the, uh, the local taxpayer advocates putting that work into the proactive outreach to congressional staff and congressional offices. Um, looking at ways that agencies in Congress can work together on legislation that'll fix problems. Um, this is something that congressional offices can ask for from other agencies. I just want to make that point really clear that whatever you're handling from the agencies, it doesn't have to be that way. And Congress is the is the entity that can ask for things to work differently. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, have you been involved in talking about creating tasks like structures at other agencies? Is that something that's been happening? Yeah, that's radar? near and dear to my heart. And, and you know, I see a question comment about the Social Security Administration. You know, there are two agencies that I think absolutely need to have a task-like entity. And one is Social Security and the other is the VA, you know, the particularly the, the disability, the hospital system, you know, where, where there is a chance of, you know, significant hardship and that it helps in those cases that may fall through the cracks for whatever reason um, or are not getting handled as quickly as possible um, or you have individuals that may not be able to navigate the system well notwithstanding all of the support groups that are out there you know in our caseload 35 to 40 percent of the cases that we got in any given year, the taxpayer actually had a representative and it was the representative, the attorney or the CPA that was coming to us saying, we can't get this moved. So it's not like just because you have support groups, you know, and advocates outside the organization that you still need that office. And um, I think in those two agencies, it's just very important to think about that. And it doesn't supplant the role. What it does is as you're working the cases, it holds the agency accountable. And because you're inside the building, you really see what's going on and what might be causing these problems. And, and the other thing that was always very interesting about this was, and we tried to show this in the annual report because our annual reports always had like 10,000 footnotes. And the point of the footnotes was 
people in the IRS have thought about this. And there's nine times out of 10, there was a study and a report and they had recommendations and it went on a shelf and it went nowhere. And no one ever saw it and it never got elevated. And part of what we would do is say, here's a really good solution to this problem. And it's been thought through. And so IRS, why are you not doing it? And saying that to them publicly to drive some systemic change if talking internally didn't do it. And I think I think that structure, again, you know, Social Security has local offices. I know many of them have been closed because of the pandemic, but you could still mimic that structure by having a local tax, you know, local Social Security or a disability advocate, you know, in, you know, in certain locations that are responsible for those cases that are falling through the cracks. And you would also see things that can improve the program overall. And the same thing on the VA side, particularly the disability rulings and things like that. Definitely. And I think that's one place where caseworkers have kind of a unique strength here and that a lot of caseworkers who handle issues with multiple agencies can kind of look across multiple agencies and see how it's done differently. So caseworkers don't underestimate your expertise and how useful that expertise is for, for oversight. You That's know, the other office I was just thinking about, you know, we did a study years ago on where there were federal agency ombudsmen or advocates, and they were all over the place, but very few of them were statutory. And that was the thing about my job was whenever anybody challenged me, I could just point to the law and say, I'm sorry, my job description's in the statute. If you don't like the statute, discuss with Congress how you want it changed and good luck with that, you know. But um, a lot of these ombuds were, were administrative. So they were buried down in the agency. They had no power individually. They certainly didn't have an order, a taxpayer assistance order. And one agency that comes to mind, and that is certainly in the news these days, is you know the Department of Education with student loan. There was a student loan ombuds, but that person has no power. And I, you know, thinking about where, you know, where you've got, you've got all sorts of loan forgiveness programs, you've got processing issues with applications and all sorts of things like that. You know, it seems to me that that's another, and it doesn't have to be for the whole agency, but there may be a program in an agency where you've got interfacing with a public and they're processing issues. And, you know, there's no one there going, what the heck is happening in this agency? And we, the, you know, the liaisons are getting, the, the caseworkers are getting all these cases and we can't get anything moved. And that might be another place that you want to put an office that, you know, is an advocate for the constituents and also a voice to Congress about why these things are happening. Definitely. And it also let you know that the reports that I delivered by law, you all Congress wrote into this law that my reports were delivered directly to the Ways and Means and Finance Committee before the Secretary of the Treasury, anyone from Office of Management and Budget, the commissioner, or any other employee of the IRS or officer of the employee of the IRS saw them. So the idea was written that this was an uncensored view of what was going on in the agency. Um, and we took that very seriously when I was there. And that's so important. I think half the battle is always trying to get that unvarnished information. So that's that's huge. And maybe that ties into the question that we have um, in the q and I wonder if I can kind of take this a little bit more broadly, but Ruby asks, um, SSA CMS used to host regular conferences where we could meet face-to-face, -face, coordinate on services. Um, it doesn't happen anymore, and that's causing some tension. So how would you suggest approaching the request for revamping such an undertaking? And maybe in general, as you're talking to agencies about, hey, we this isn't working. What can How can this be better? Just how I, would you just approach that framing? I really think, you know, I don't know how these, you know, looking at the the oversight committees of SSA getting members of Congress to sign a letter to the SSA commissioner and saying, we value this. And this helped to resolve issues that so that you did it at a meeting rather than 200 cases that or, you know, inquiries that come to your caseworkers. So it's efficient that you would hold these meetings. And we really ask that you work with us to schedule them. And and I think that it has, you know, it ha that kind of, you know, 
request, I would just stop trying to go to the overworked frontline people and just leap above saying in a really positive way, we really value them and they helped solve problems and reduced work on your frontline folks. And so we really want to reinstate them. And here's what we're suggesting. And maybe even give some dates. <laughs> You know, like we would like this one in here and this one here and this one here. Let's do it. Um, or ask for a meeting with the commissioner and saying, what can we do to expedite these happening? Um, sometimes because people get so, you know, they get so filled with like what's right before them that they can't see the forest for the trees and that they can't see that having that meeting solves problems so that you don't have those 200 problems that come at you throughout the rest of the year. They just can't see that. They can't see beyond what's right in front of them. And you need to just go up in a, in a polite and respectful way until polite and respectful doesn't work anymore. And then, you know, you have an oversight hearing. The big, bad oversight hearings. <laughs> well, I never viewed the oversight hearings yeah. as big and bad, but some do. So, for sure. Um, and that's uh, that's really helpful for just, again, talking about how important that meeting can be. And we've touched on this a little bit, just for kind of the best practices, again, from Taxpayer Advocate, was having that first meeting with new caseworkers, with new offices, where y'all set timelines for when to expect responses. We talk, talked about escalation procedures. Um, talked had those in person. That sounds also incredibly helpful. Just onboarding for new offices. So for for offices and caseworkers working with agencies where that's not standard, who would like to kind of request that that first meeting with the folks that they'll be working with locally, um, is there anything else that they should ask for? Just what else is helpful for setting off those relationships on the right foot? Well, I think you've really covered it. I just think you want continuing relationships with them. Um, I know that, you know, when we set up meetings, we would often invite, you know, you mentioned the low income taxpayer clinics at the beginning. Um, you know, one that I founded, we, there are low income taxpayer clinics throughout the United States that are funded by the by the Internal Revenue Service and a, fed, a grant from Congress. Um, you know, to represent low income taxpayers pro bono before the IRS. And we would often bring the, you know, representatives of the low income taxpayer clinic community into our meetings, you know, and we coordinated meetings so they could talk about what they're seeing from the low income constituents that they're having. Um, sometimes we coordinated with state officials, state tax officials, just because there's a spillage effect, you know, on the state side and congressional offices were concerned about what might be happening there even though it's not, you know, directly in their jurisdiction, but it's affecting their constituents. So having that communication, I'd say the other thing is, you know, on an ongoing basis, I can remember any number of times where there were issues that were really local to the specific office, you know, the specific geographic area, there was one thing that had to do with subsidence, and it was in the Northeast. And had to do with whether there's going to be a casualty, you know, could you take the casualty loss for this subsidence that happened in foundations, there were crumbling foundations, and it affected certain communities crossing some state lines, but in a particular corner. And, you know, ultimately, the members of, you know, it was the, the, the local taxpayer advocates were getting these cases and the constituent, the con caseworkers were raising it with the local taxpayer advocates. And they finally elevated it to me because it really was above their pay grade. Like we had to get, you know, the jet, the chief counsel to look at this and go, you need to issue a ruling on this and this isn't going away. And and that kind of relationship, if you've got a strong enough relationship with your local taxpayer advocate, not only you're getting the cases there, but you can actually get systemic advocacy done. The cases are representing something. You may only have five cases in house, but it's affecting an, an entire population of your constituents. And to get that fix is really important. Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of thing that. Um, you can really have if you have a good relationship with that, if you keep in touch with your local taxpayer, not just about cases, but about the systemic issues as well. That's fascinating. I was like, one of my favorite things about casework is just like super hyper local weird edge policy cases, because those always come up in casework and I just find them so fascinating. 
Um, but speaking of just having that great relationship, um, maybe we can talk about escalating on, on another level. So I know I, when I worked with taxpayer advocates, um, sometimes they just absolutely went above and beyond for our constituents, just with better service than I could have ever expected or asked for. Um, and I've seen that with other agencies too. Sometimes you just get a liaison who is just fantastic. Um, any advice for caseworkers on saying thank you? Are there particular ways that would be uh, specifically helpful for those liaison folks? Oh, I, I loved getting letters, you know, from people saying your case advocate did the following. And it gave me an opportunity to just personally shoot an email to that person and say, uh, you've just done a great job and, and you've just, you know, embodied everything that TAS stands for. And thank you for doing that. And then the other thing that we did was we created an award that we called the Bulldog Award, just mainly because I had this image of a bulldog grabbing onto like a piece of cloth and like, you know, going like that and never letting it go. And it really went to, you know, my, the managers could nominate it, but sometimes members of Congress, because they sent us a letter and I looked at the case, like, well, what was this all about? And you would see that this, this case advocate or this local taxpayer advocate had this, and they were just not giving up on it. And they would hit a wall and they'd think about something else and they'd do a wall and it just, you know, went, yay, kitties. And it just went, you know, and it was just like, and we would, we would give that award and we had to sanitize the case because I couldn't read the facts of the case out to even my own employees because of confidentiality, but we could sanitize it to give a sense of what that person had to do. And that was recognized, you know, and that just, it both reinforced to the rest of my employees what was expected of them, even though it was above and beyond. And, you know, and norm, normalized that you should, when you see something like this, don't give up, you know, and also seek help. And so, you know, that was great. And someone's saying that, you know, calling the exceptional, oh, that means everything to them. That just means everything to have your boss call them. It just makes all the difference in the world. It shoots them over the moon, you know. Definitely. And I'll say too, just if if it's possible, I know we did this a few times when I was a caseworker, but to just have my boss go to the local office and just not yeah. with an agenda, just shake hands. And we brought donuts a few times and just, you know, what can we do for you? Thank you for all the, all the work that you do. Uh, training. Well, you know, the, when you hire somebody afresh, it's usually, we, there's usually like a, a, two week training period initially. And then what we like to do is we'll train them on some basic things and then get them at, to their desk with a, an on the job trainer with them, you know, somebody from their office that's helping them with the cases, but then they're assigned some very simple things, but so that they are on the phones and you are listening to them. And then you're able then to take them back for another two weeks of training on a slightly higher issue. And then you put them out, you know, taking cases, working on that so that you're building on their skills as they go along. And then after about a year of that, we actually are letting them choose, are they really interested in particular areas that they want to work? But we want to, like, if you're coming from an audit background, then we're going to put you on collection cases because you've, you, know, you, don't, you can't choose what you're getting in the sense that everybody gets something from everywhere. And often an audit case is coming to you as a collection case because the IRS is collecting money and the taxpayer is saying, I don't owe this. I don't think I owe this. So yeah, you can do an audit, but you've got to know what to do to stop collection. Um, and so uh, some of the, most of them come from other positions in the IRS. So they're starting from some baseline, but again, that baseline, because the IRS is so stovepiped and we want generalists that then we build specialties on top of that, that first year of training is really generalist training. You're going to know something about everything. And you're going to also need to know where to find more information about specific issues. And that's our focus that first year. Um, but we also have technical advisors that are kind of corporate advisors. And um, you can, if you're on a case and you're stuck, and this goes back to the previous question, like when somebody's not responsive, sometimes there is a technical issue and the person doesn't know the answer. 
and they're just not reaching out to the resources that we have to get an answer. And so that might be another thing that you could say is, is this really a technical issue? Is this, do we need to bring in someone else from your, from your staff, from the technical advisors to help you find out what's the right path or what's blocking this? Because there are those resources there, at least in TAS, that they are supposed to reach out to. There's a whole system where you can put in, I need help in this case. Here's some basic facts. Here's the link to the case so that you can look at the history. And um, that's their, these people's job. That's so important. Lovely. Yeah. The, the comment about from Senator Hassan saying thank you. That's really lovely. That that really means a lot to the case advocates, you know, because as I say to people, you know, often they're spending their day on the phone being yelled at by taxpayers. And then they go over to the IRS employees saying we need the following and they get yelled at by the IRS employees. And, you know, where somebody's saying, you know, I don't have any time to, you know, you know, you know you're just, you know, and you're just, you know, making, you know, eh. and, you know, Part of when you talk about the training, a lot of the training that we spent was how to manage stress, you know, and and leaving things behind at the end of the day so that you are able to have. And this is probably really important for you all, too. You know, it's really important for you to close that office door at the end of the day and go do something really nice for yourself, because if you keep living it through the rest of the night, you're going to start the next day stressed and awful and, and you're not going to be bright and you don't give your brain the time to really think through the problem. And your brain does amazing things subconsciously. It, it will come up with solutions that if you keep massaging it and the frontal lobes of your brain, you won't get that answer. You've got to give yourself a chance to cogitate in those deeper sections of your brain. And that's that virtual or literal act of shutting the door. Now I'm in my kitchen, so I can't shut the door on my, you know, but I try to do mental, I try to practice that mentally. And I, we really focused on that with our employees. They never really believed me, but you know, that's just, but you keep saying it because it's really important and eventually it'll get through. That's so, so, so important. And I know we talk a lot about that for caseworkers too. And for the casework managers on the call, and just being aware of your your team and how they're doing and giving them the grace to be able to close that door. I, I, I really do believe will ultimately mean that you get better work from them. You can do better things for your constituents. That is absolutely vitally important. Um, now, we did get a question submitted in advance that I'd love to, to get your perspective on. Um, so someone asked, uh, it sounded like a situation they're having where they were working with one liaison and then that liaison left suddenly and didn't know who was coming in afterwards. And so they've had some cases kind of lost in that gap in staff turnover. I know that's been a huge issue for some agencies. Um, do you have any advice for how to handle those, those moments between liaisons? Yeah, you know. In TAS, and I, my understanding is this is happening a lot with TAS right now, that you have acting local taxpayer advocates. And some of that is for training. You know, you've got some people that are coming up as managers and you want them in that role for a period of time. And they're getting a whole new world of experience. And, and you know, they may not know what to do or they may be less than forthcoming. On the other hand, they may be really excited about the job and you may get better service than from the regular person. But those gaps are really important. And, you know, what we tried to do was, was you know, make sure that there was someone responsible for each case. And I'd also say that at least in tasks, because there is a case advocate on the case, even though we wanted um you know, the communication with the local taxpayer advocate, you could find out who the local, the case advocate is on the case and continue to be able to communicate with that case advocate, even if there wasn't somebody filled in. Now, when you're working specifically through a liaison and you may not know who's working the case other than the liaison, again, that is where I would go and elevate. And the level of elevation I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. And I would also say that there needs to be a system in the agency so that it is easy to do substitution. So that that whoever, you know, that, that it, there's a very clear system where 
if you don't, first of all, you know who to contact if you don't know who the liaison is and there's been a change, but that the system would actually communicate with all the local offices to say there's been a change in liaison and here's the contact number of that person. And this can be programmed. It's like, it can be an email, you know? Um, so I think, I think that's something that you could discuss if you're seeing that with an agency, you know, how can we come up with a better system? And also if you can get to those meetings that we were talking about earlier, that can be an agenda item on the meeting. Um, you know, how do you, how do you communicate with that person? Um, one thing is, does it have to be a personal email or can it be a congressional liaison email so that, that the agency can assign that email to the correct person? You I mean, you'll know who that person is when they respond and you'll have a communication with that person, but, you know, or there's a second email box that they can they can forward it. They can send behind the scenes who owns that email now. We've replaced that person. Uh, those are just some suggestions. They're, they're difficult issues because things are changing so much. Definitely. And that's a huge point that I think part of what's so difficult for a lot of agencies and being responsive is just that technical debt, <clears throat> excuse me, that we talked about right at the beginning that uh, for I know some DC liaison offices are tracking cases on spreadsheets. Um, that live on someone's desktop. So one person has access to them and they're handling 40,000 casework inquiries on a spreadsheet. I mean, that's ultimately not sustainable and that's gotta be part of Congress advocating for better. Well, yeah, and we had a case management system. It's an old case management system, but we had a separate code for congressional cases. So I could ask, let me see where all the congressional cases are listed in all of the United States and all of our offices. And I could see which office, and I could even see cycle time on responses. I could see resolution rates on congressional cases. You know, we really set up our system to track what was going with all of our cases, but also that we could pull a picture of the congressional cases. And if we saw, you know, missed follow-up dates, missed next contact dates on those cases, long cycle times on those cases, um, you know, those were things where maybe we'd ask the local taxpayer advocate what's going on. And and that would be a conversation between the local taxpayer advocates manager, you know, but we our my analysts were looking at that and we were doing training. I, I also have to say this, and this is probably pretty good to say as a closing thing. I mean, we had a meeting usually twice a year with all of my local taxpayer advocates and always on the agenda was congressional cases and congressional relationships. You know, how do you work those congressional cases? And we would always say, you know, these are the people who fund the taxpayer advocate service. If you want to keep funding for the taxpayer advocate service and they value them, you better be giving them good constituent service. There's a direct connection there. And, um, you know, sometimes that would get through and sometimes that wouldn't, but it was always part of our training. That's wonderful. And I think that was such a huge part of why TASP was so, so wonderful to work with under your leadership, Nina. Um, Nina, thank you, thank you, thank you so, thank you. so, so much for joining us today. It's a fascinating conversation. And I think I, I definitely wish that I'd had some of your, your advice and expertise before or when I was uh, when I was a caseworker. So thank I'll you. Again. Know, just in closing, if there's anyone on the call that wants to work on getting an advocate system set up in any one of the agencies that you care about, you can find me You and you can put out my email address and let everybody know you can reach out to me. I'm more than happy working with you on any kind of legislation about that. It's something really important. Wonderful. And I will take you up on that and send out uh, send out how to find you, Nina. Really appreciate that. Awesome. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Two quick things to flag. Um, we talked a little bit about data here and how important that is. So I want to flag we will have a data for caseworkers training on March 30th. So stay, uh, keep your eyes open for an uh, invite from me on that. We'll also be opening our professional development program for more deep divey conversations uh, on casework uh, soon. So again, keep an eye out for an email. Uh, email from me on that. Again, if y'all want to get in touch, please, please, please don't hesitate. My email is ann at potfox.org. You can also reach out to us at casework at potfox.org. And all of our resources, including our 
intro to working with agencies, uh, casework chapter, manual chapter is at potfox.org slash casework. Nina, thank you again for being here. Everybody, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day.